Hello, I'm Rocco Moretti, a research professor in the Myler Lab, and I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to the structural biology of antibodies. Uh, hopefully, the, this will give a little bit of a background of you know, antibodies and, and how they work in a structural biology concept, um, and then hopefully, you know, this would make some of the work that you're doing within the workshop a little bit easier to understand. So, one of the sort of the keys, the, the central dogma, if you will, of structural biology is the concept that the sequence of the protein determines the structure of the protein, and the structure of the protein is really what determines that function. And so a lot of what we do with antibody modeling and looking at antibody and antigen interactions is working through that process. So we have a sequence of a particular antibody and an antigen, or, um, and then from that sequence, we use computational methods to determine the structure of both the antibody and the antigen. Um, and also the, the structure of the complex. And from that, we can sort of determine the function of the antibody. Does it bind to this antigen? How does it bind? What does it do? And then in design processes, we can sort of go the other way. So we can take a particular function that we want. For example, we want an antigen to bind, uh, an antibody to bind to a certain antigen, or we want to develop an antigen that you know, can bind to a particular antibody. And then from that function, we then determine what the structure of the complex is and then the, the loops of the antibody. And then from that structure, we can now determine a sequence. We can put a sequence on the, that structure. And then from that sequence, we can then go into the lab and hopefully produce an antibody or an antigen that has the desired function. And so backing, giving sort of a diagrammatic big picture view, you know, so what is an antibody? And the sort of the diagrammatic, the, the schematic that you see in biochemistry textbooks of those little Ys, that's actually relatively close to what they look like in reality. Um, so we, we have a representation here of, you know, this, that Y diagram of the antibody. Um, and so the antibody consists of two heavy chains and two light chains. Uh, the he heavy chains bind together um, in, in the stem of the Y um, and are held together by a number of disulfide bonds. Um, and then each of those heavy chains would then pair with a light chain. And that light and that heavy light chain pairing, again, is held together by disulfide bonds. Um, we can also look at the antibody by, you know, sort of the variable and constant region. So, you know, the stem region and a good portion of the, the arms of the Y are structurally consistent as far as they don't differ very much from different antibodies. And this is sort of the region of the antibody that's connected to the rest of the, uh, the immune system. And so once an antibody recognizes its target, it's you know, this constant region that interacts with the rest of the immune system and promotes the immune response. Um, but the thing that really distinguishes different antibodies is the variable region. So this is actually the antigen binding region. And so through this sort of tips of the Y, you, know, you will bind to the antigen um, in the variable region. And this is sort of what gives that the antibodies their structural spe specificity and affinity. A little backing up a little bit for terminology. So the full length antibody, this complete Y that we're talking about, that's the Ig or the immunoglobulin. Um, and then we can also look at sort of the arms of the Y, um, which are sort of easy to, to cleave off with um, proteolytic techniques. And this is called the, the fragment antigen binding region or FAB. And then we can look at just specifically the very tips of the Ys, that's the FV or fragment variable region, and this is where the an antigen interaction occurs. And when we do computational modeling, because the, the rest of the protein is sort of more or less constant throughout various antibodies, a lot of the time uh, we don't actually bother modeling that um, or even representing that within the computer. A lot of the times, just for computational efficiency, we look specifically at the, the FB region, that fragment variable region that's the interaction domain. Um, and that specifically modeling that tends to give you most of the information that you need to model the antibodies. Um, so that was a schematic representation. And so we can sort of look at more of a three-dimensional structural biology representation here, and you'll see it matches very well, where you have the two heavy chains in shades of red here, each of them bound to a light chain in, in blue. And so this, the space filling representation is over on the left. And if you look at more on the ribbon diagram on the right, you'll see that both the heavy chain and the light chain are built up of these sort of smaller segments, these smaller domains. 
Um, and each of these domains has a very similar fold, and it's called the immunoglobulin domain fold. Um, and it's a beta sh sheet sandwich, so you have these two sheets of four uh, strands each that are bound together. And sort of the real key for this, for the, you know, the, the antibodies, is the fact that this is able to present you know, a number of loops at the very edge of the, uh, of the domain. And it's actually these uh, loops, which are called the complementarity determining regions, which are the sort of the main interactions with the antigen. And this is what def defines the specificity of the, ends of the, of the antibody. Um, and so you have, you know, three of these loops are sort of the, the primary interaction sites, um, and these are labeled CDR, one, two, and three, and then you also have, you know, it's HCDRs for the heavy chain, LCDRs for the light chain, um, and then the rest of the FV domain is termed the framework region. Um, the framework region does indeed have some interactions with um, the antigen in a number of different cases, um, but for the majority of antibodies, the, the majority of the interaction is through, you know, those six CDRs, the three on the heavy chain and the three on the Um, and you can see this in actually, if you look at sequencing results. Um, so if you take a number of different antibodies, so the immune repertoire of uh, you know, humans, you can take a look and see that you know, the variability in sequence that you see within the framework regions is low compared with the variability that you see in the CDRs. And that's reflected of the fact that the, the main distinguishing between you know, antibodies that recognize different antigens are these CDR regions. That's where um, most of the, the changes that affect specificity are. Um, and it's, and you, in a structural biology context, you can see this as the fact that those loop regions, those CDRs, are the things which are actually contacting the epitope or the, the region of the antigen um, which the, the body is binding to. And so the variability in the CDRs comes in part by the way they're produced. Um, and so Antibodies are produced by B lymphocytes, which are derived from, you know, immune cells, progenitors. So the hemopoietic stem cells in your bone marrow grow and differentiate, and one of the cells that they differentiate into is a B lymphocyte, which is where the antibodies are produced. And in that maturation process, as you go from that undifferentiated stem cell to a mature B cell, you know, each B cell um, that develops uh, generates a new uh, antibody that's associated with it. And so generally speaking, there's a, for each B cell, there's a single antibody that that B cell produces. And the variability that you see is, comes from a bit more or less four distinct processes that sort of combine together to give you this large immune repertoire that you see um, within uh, your uh, immune system. And those are VDJ recombination, junctional diversity, heavy light chain parity, pairing, and affinity maturation. And we'll go through each of those in turn. Uh, so VDJ recombination it re represents the fact that the, you don't have just a single antibody gene within your genome. Instead, antibodies are represented in the genome as a number of different fragments. And there's actually a, a, a library of, of each of those different fragments. Um, which vary slightly depending on which particular um, genes you're talking about. So you have uh, the IgH are the heavy chain of the antibodies, and then K and L are different types of light chains. Um, and so for the heavy chains, you have um, V, D, and J genes um, that can recombine together. And for the light chains, it's just the V and J genes that re recombine. But the process is a sort of a combinatorial reassortment where as the B cell matures, it, you know, it picks one of the V genes, one of the D genes, one of the J genes, and merges them together into that single antibody. Um, and so by this process, you get this sort of combinatorial explosion of you know, possibilities of you know, what the, the antibody can be made of. So uh, that's further refined by the junctional diversity, which is the process, you know, the process of combining these different genes is not perfect. So there's a little bit of um, noise in where they overlap. Um, and so as you combine these 
fragments, what happens is that uh, non-templated nucleotides are added uh, to the, the, the junction. Um, and because of this, you know, you have some amino acid variability within that particular junction. Uh, and you can see this within uh, where these junctions happen. Um, and so it's specifically within the, the CDR3, which tends to be the most variable of the CDRs, um, that this VDJ, you know, this junctional diversity happens, and, and also the, the variability with the D gene for the heavy chains. Um, the CDR1 and the CDR2 are a little less variable um, as they're driven primarily just by the, the V gene. And then finally, uh, well, I shouldn't say finally, but you know, an additional for the naive uh, B cells, um, one additional way of making uh, diversity is through the heavy and light chain pairing. So the VDJ recombination and, and the junctional diversity happens independently for both the heavy chain and the light chain. And so that combinatorial assortment, you know, you can have, you know, there you have selection of one, selection of the other, they come together to form the full antibody. Um, and because of that, you have that sort of more combinatorial assortment um, that further diversifies the possibilities for the naive antibodies. And so all of those three processes happen um, in the naive antibodies that happen in the bone marrow before the, the B cells are exposed to any antigens. Uh, and then, but once the, the full antibody is formed, there's a process by which um, further diversification is, in, uh, is created. Um, and that's through the affinity maturation process. And so you have the naive antibodies and it's presented by the immune system to new antigens. And those antibodies, those B cells, which produce antibodies that can recognize these new antigens that you see, um, there's a feedback process by which if, if that antibody binds, um, the immune system causes that B cell to grow and, div and, and, and divide. And in the div division process, you have additional diversity that's introduced into that antibody through random mutations. And then that same selection process where the ones that bind well continue to grow and divide, and the ones that don't bind well um, are killed off by, via apoptosis. Um, and through this process, you know, accumulating mutations that continually refine and improve the affinity for the, of the antibody towards its antigen you know, this is how you get the very highly specific, highly active uh, antibodies that your immune system can produce. So once we've produced antibodies that have the specificity and affinity we need, we can go into the lab and do some synthetic biology techniques to sort of refine them further. Um, and so one of the very common approaches is used is humanized antibodies. So just for practical purposes, it's a lot easier to create antibodies to an antigen in a model system like a mouse than it is in a human. And so a large number of the antibodies that are produced for specific antigens are in animals such as mice. Um, that raises a little bit of problem if you're trying to use those antibodies for uh, human therapeutic uses in that the constant regions of the mouse antibody are different from the constant regions of a human antibody and therefore might not interact with the immune system as well or may indeed impact uh, an immune response in their, on their own um, which would defeat the purpose of the, the antibodies. And so a lot of times what happens with the mouse produced antibodies is you go into a process of humanization. And there's several different levels of that. Um, so to the first is the production of the chimeric antibody. And so this recognizes the fact that the FV region of the, of the antibody contains the, the antigen binding domain. And so if you take the FV region from the, the optimized mouse antibody that recognizes the, the antigen domain, you can graft that onto a constant region from a human antibody. Um, and then that chimeric antibody that has a mouse FV and a human constant region, um, it then has less of immune um, issues um, that, than a fully mouse antibody. You can go even further and go into the humanized antibody, recognizing the fact that it's really just the CDR regions that are important for the recognition of the antigen. So you can take just those CDR regions, graft those on to a, a likely human, a human antibody, um, and so have the framework regions in the v, FV regions um, that are the same as the human's antibodies, but only have those mouse 
generated loops. Um, and these are the humanized antibodies, um, which present less of a mouse target uh, to the human immune system, although they do require a little bit more work in the fact that you need to find or engineer a human antibody that is able to present the CDRs in the appropriate locations with the, with the appropriate framework region. An alternative synthetic biology approach um, is that one of uh, bispecific antibodies. And so an antibody has two antigen recognition sites normally, so the two arms of the Y. Um, and normally what happens is that both of those recognize the same antigen. So they have identical heavy chains and identical light chains, and so the tips of the Ys are identical. Uh, but one approach you can do synth with synthetic biology is create um, a bispecific antibody. So each of the arms of the Y recognizes a different target. And those can be used in various approaches where you want to take you know, two separate molecules and bring them in close proximity for some reason. Um, the trick of this is, of course, to make sure that the antibody assembles in the correct fashion. Um, and so each of those arms needs has its own heavy chain, its own light chain, and you need to assemble an antibody that has one heavy and one light of the same type of the appropriate type, and then make sure that the light chains of, is associated with the correct heavy chains. And so if you do this naively, um, you'll often see that you waste a lot of your, your heavy and light chains on mispairing, and you only get a small fraction of the correct assembly. Um, and so there has been work done in Rosetta to try and figure out um, and engineer the heavy and light chains and the interaction between them such that you are more specific um, such that the, the light chain pairs with the appropriate heavy chain, the heavy, and the, the two heavy chains associate with each other in a, a heterodimer as opposed to associating with one of them with themselves. Um, and that's sort of a reference down below if, if you're interested in looking more into that work. Um, and so a lot of the work in you know, classifying antibody structures have been done by you know, other labs even outside of the Rosetta community. Um, and so there's been a large amount of work looking at the structural biology of antibodies and classifying the, the different um, CDRs into different categories. Um, there's also been a lot of work looking at, you know, classifying, you know, the, the various, you know, V, D, and J genes, you know, where from a, a sequence of a fully matured antibody, you know, which particular V, D, gene does it come from, which particular D gene does it have, that sort of thing. Um, and so there's a number of different web tools that will allow you to, to input a sequence um, and then come up with some information about, you know, which particular genes it's come from in the germline cells, um, and then also, you know, sort of where those junctions are uh, and predicting where the, you know, the CDR loops start. So with that, um, hopefully this gives a good background in regards to the structural biology of antibodies. Um, and hopefully uh, will allow you to understand some of the work that it is doing in the other tutorials a little bit better.